welcome everybody uh, to our Friday night study. We're going to continue reading A.T. Jones and commenting on it. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> a dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the time that we have this evening. Um, I know it's the Sabbath for some, but for, as the Sabbath approaches, Lord, we ask uh, for your Spirit's presence, for the blessings of the Sabbath, for the studies. And we pray for those searching for truth. We ask, Lord, that um, you can be with them, that your Holy Spirit can continue to speak to them and teach them. We're thankful for the people you've brought into our lives uh, to minister to and to minister unto us. Um, we're thankful for the fellowship that we have. We pray, Lord, that as we continue to read A.T. Jones, that we can understand the message as it was given and its application for this time. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good evening again and happy Sabbath. Now, we've been reading through Jones 1895 General Conference Bulletin articles is sermons and we're at number five now we know that with the 1893 that jones understands that he's in the time of the sunday law and he still sees that what's happening around him and he spent a bit of time uh, discussing uh the ideas the papal and protestant ideas that exist and and now he's going to talk a bit more about what's happening, but also the message he's moving into uh, how this relates to righteousness by faith, the third angel's message. So he says, after meeting had closed last night, a question was asked, which requires notice in the same line of the last remarks we had as to the influence of Christianity in civilizing people beyond the limit of those whom it Christianizes that is a fact, and a good illustration is before us in Christianity in the Roman Empire, which will answer the question and also illustrate the principle. When Christianity started in the Roman Empire, there was no such, no such thing known as rights of conscience. In fact, there was no such thing known as the rights of the individual of any kind and of the rights of the conscience or the chief of all rights, of course, this was the least known. Christianity means nothing if not the rights of conscience. That was its one claim that overtopped everything else. Of course, included, included everything else as it entered the Roman Empire. The contest between Christianity and all the power of the Roman Empire was upon the Christian's claim of the right of conscience. The empire of Rome denying it because the empire did not know anything about it. Rome said, what the law says is right. And what the law says from the law itself, as it is in itself, from that alone do we get the idea of right and wrong. What the law says to be done, that is right. And what it prohibits, that is wrong. And that is the reason as to why it is right or wrong. But the Christian says what God says is right. That is right. What God says is wrong, that is wrong. To Rome, the state was God, and therefore the maxim, the voice of the people is the voice of God. And as the law was the voice of the people, so the law was the voice of the Roman God. Therefore, when the Christian denied the Roman God and asserted the right of conscience toward the true God, he himself became judge of the right or wrong of the law, which to the Roman mind, was in itself the test of right or wrong. The contest went on for 250 years before it was settled in favor of the rights of conscience. And by that time, the principles of Christianity had so impressed the pagans, who made no profession of anything but paganism, that the rights of conscience were sacred, so that when the apostasy seized the civil power and began to use it in behalf of what they called the Christian religion, then pagans pleaded 
the right of con rights of conscience. There's the whole story. Christianity, the principles of Christianity, Christianized multitudes of people. The Christianizing of these people fixed in them, in its integrity, the rights of conscience. And there it was so fixed that they would die rather than yield. That was genuine Christianity. These were Christianized. And by their integrity, at the expense of every consideration and holding to that principle, pagans themselves are impressed by it to the point to which they pled it when occasion offered. There is where Christianity Christianized one multitude and civilized another. Now, I, I want to go to uh, something that Heidi and I have been reading um, every morning and evening. We've been reading uh, uh, five testimonies. And I want to go there to something that Ellen White says. Um, let's see if I can find this here. It's, uh, I believe, chapter seven. Now, go to the screen here. Now, this is chapter seven of five testimonies. Um, just making sure, yeah. So it's testimony number 31, Testimonies for the Church, chapter seven. Now, this is a chapter on jealousy and fault finding. Um, condemning them, not telling us how to do them. Um, so there's some interesting things that she says in this, this one. And I'm just going to try to see if I can find, because I don't want to read this whole thing. Um, is it this one? Just hang on. Might be the preceding one. Policy. This is where I want to be. So this is chapter seven. Okay. This is exactly what I wanted. Um, I'm going to start from the beginning here. So there's just, there's too much here to miss. It pains me to say that there are unruly tongues among church members. There are false tongues that feed on mischief. They are sly whispering tongues. There is tattling, impertinent meddling, adroit quizzing. Among the lovers of gossip, some are actuated by curiosity, others by jealousy, many by hatred against those through whom God has spoken to reprove them. All of these discordant elements are at work. Some conceal their real sentiments, while others are eager to publish all they know, or even suspect of evil against another. I saw that the very spirit of perjury that would turn truth into falsehood, good into evil, and innocence into crime is now active. Satan exalts over the condition of God's professed people, while many are neglecting their own souls. They eagerly watch for an opportunity to criticize and condemn others. All have defects of character, and it is not hard to find some, something that jealousy can interpret into their, or to their injury. Now, say these self-constituted judges, we have facts. We will fasten upon them an accusation from which they cannot clear themselves. They wait for a fitting opportunity and then produce their bundle of gossip and bring forth their tidbits. In their efforts to carry a point, persons who have naturally a strong imagination are in danger of deceiving themselves and deceiving others. They gather up unguarded expressions from another, not considering that words may be uttered hastily and hence may not reflect the real sentiments of the speaker. But those unpremeditated remarks are often so trifling as to be unworthy of notice, are viewed through Satan's magnifying glass, pondered and repeated until molehills become mountains. Separated from God, the surmisers of evil become the sport of temptation. They scarcely know the strength of their feelings or the effect of their words. While condemning the errors of others, 
they indulge far greater errors themselves. Consistency is a jewel. Is there no law of kindness to be observed? Have Christians been authorized of God to criticize and condemn one another? Is it honorable or even honest to win from the lips of another under the guise of friendship secrets which have been entrusted to him and then turn the knowledge thus gained to his injury? Is it Christian charity to gather up every floating report, to unearth everything that will cast suspicion on the character of another, and then take delight in using it to injure him? Satan exalts when he can defame or wound a follower of Christ. He is the accuser of our brethren. Shall Christians aid him in his work? God's all-seeing eye notes the defects of all and the ruling passion of each. Yet he bears with our mistakes and pities our weaknesses. He bids the people cherish the same spirit of tenderness and forbearance. True Christians will not exalt in exposing the faults and deficiencies of others. They will turn away from vileness and deformity to fix the mind upon that which is attractive and lovely. To the Christian, every act of fault finding, every word of censure or condemnation is painful. There have always been men and women who profess the truth, who have not conformed their lives to its sanctifying influence. Men who are unfaithful, yet deceiving themselves and encouraging themselves in sin. Unbelief is seen in their life, their deportment and character. And this terrible evil acts as does a canker. Would all professed Christians use their investigative powers to see what evils needed to be corrected in themselves? Instead of talking of others' wrongs, there would be a more healthy condition in the church today. Some will be honest when it costs nothing. But when policy will pay best, honesty is forgotten. Honesty and policy will not work together in the same mind. In time, either policy will be expelled and truth and honesty reign supreme, or if policy is cherished, honesty will be forgotten. They are never in agreement. They have nothing in common. One is the prophet of Baal. The other is the true prophet of God. When the Lord makes up his jewels, the true, the frank, the honest, will be looked upon with pleasure. Angels are employed in making crowns for such ones. And upon these star-gemmed crowns will be reflected with splendor, the light which radiates from the throne of God. Um, so I, I brought this out specifically for this paragraph, but I wanted you to see the context of it. Now, in the conflict of policy, we have principle, but here she uses honesty. And, and that kind of gives you something about, you know, honesty is the best policy. You can kind of see how that relates. Um, Right. So really, it's it's against policy. Honesty and policy have nothing in common. Right. Ellen White says. Now, when we look at um, what Jones is talking about here. Um, we think of civilization as governed by policies, by laws, by rules. Right. That's what makes civilization. Right. What, what is the basis of civilization? What makes people civilized, according to Jones and according to Alan White? What, what does it mean to be civilized? Accepting rules that allow people to treat each other with respect. Okay. Um, so he talks here, because we had read this here, about what right or wrong was. So, yeah. 
Samuel puts having free conscience. So the, the Rome just believed that the law was right or wrong. That is, they were operating by policy. The policies were created by the government. And so there was no questioning whether something was right or wrong if it was a law. The lo justice was the law. The law was the definition of right and wrong. And, but that really, without honesty, without Christianity, without the principles of the gospel, um, that's just policy. It's the opposite of the gospel. Now, Christianity brought in the rights of conscience. But really, what the rights of conscience are is about honesty, if you think about it. Um, some of you are familiar with Dr. Jordan Peterson. He wrote a book, uh, <clears throat> 12 Rules for Life. Um, but one of his rules is uh, tell the truth, or at least do not lie, right? So one of the basic principles that he sees that he had to follow in his life was to be honest, honest with himself and honest with others, not just saying things that are not true is never a good idea. And we can see that what Christianity can do for a person is it can, it can make him an honest man. Right, honest with his own sins. And we can see how what people do when they criticize others, um, when they spread gossip and rumors and lies and so forth, that what they're doing is the opposite of honesty. And often they use policy as a means of controlling others. So they're not truly civilized. So when Christianity seizes the civil power, as, as Jones is saying here, so when the apostasy seized the civil power and began to use it in behalf of what they called the Christian re religion, then pagans pleaded for the rights of conscience. So when you have civil power, when, when the church loses the power of the gospel, it seeks the power of the state. Why is that? What has happened to the church when it seizes the power of the state? I mean, it's, it's not using, it's lost the power of the gospel, but why has it lost it? Okay, so it's the image of the beast. Now, the image of the beast, does it just exist when the state controls uh, the conscience. I mean, is that the only place it exists? No. Because we can have the image of the beast in how we deal with one another. If we're following policy, if we're not honest, right? if we're avoiding our own sins by magnifying the sins of others, we are, we are exercising, we're, we're, we're doing Satan's work for him. We're making an image to the beast. And, and we'll see how important this is, you know, in understanding the gospel, as Jones lays it out here. Um, now here's, he's talking about uh, Christianized. There's the whole story of Christianity, the principles of, of Christianity, Christianized multitudes of people. That is, there are lots of people who aren't necessarily Christians as such, but they are Christianized. That is, they can see the value in, in the Christian religion, in the values that we have hold today. Much, much of the values that people hold, even people who claim to be atheists, are actually Christian values. And Atheism provides no basis for those values, right? But they're inconsistent. 
because they can see the values, the value of the values in Christianity, the value of the principles of Christianity in some areas. And they, they will demand them of other people, though not always follow them themselves, because they don't have the power of the gospel to follow them. Um, so, so here we have what he's talking about, this Christianized multitudes of people. The Christianizing of these people fixed in them, in its integrity, the rights of conscience. And there it was so fixed that they would die rather than yield. That was genuine Christianity. These were Christianized and by their integrity at the expense of every consideration and holding to that principle, pagans themselves were impressed by it to the point to which they pled it when occasion offered. There is where Christianity Christianized one multitude and civilized another. This illustrates the principles which we are studying that Christianity, if held faithfully by those who profess it, will exert upon those who are not Christianized by it, upon those who make no pretensions of Christianity at all, an influence for good that will elevate them above savagery and above the base principles and ways of civilized paganism. Macaulay's discovered the principle too and expressed it in a sentence that is one of the most powerful human statements there is in literature in favor of Christianity. In writing of India, in a certain place, he makes this remark. A man needs not to be a Christian to desire that Christianity should be spread in India. That tells a whole story. Now, a Christian wants Christianity spread in India for Christ's sake, for the sake of souls who will be Christianized. The man who is not a Christian can well wish for Christianity to be in India for the sake of the poor heathen that would be elevated even if they do not become Christians. That is the thought. But the mischief has always been, and it is yet, that Christianity is not taken and held for what it is by those who profess it. God is not given large enough place in the profession of it by those who profess it. And by not being given large enough place, he does not have any chance to demonstrate the real power of Christianity in these people who do not give him the place place that belongs to him in which he would demonstrate the divinity of Christianity with power that would convince. Then men finding the loss of that divine power and influence, they go about to do by themselves and by human power the things that would be done by the Lord if only they would give him the place that belongs to him in their profession. That is why professed Christians must, must put themselves forward and propose to legislate or get into office or manage and dictate to those who do legislate or are in office and all to give things a Christian mold and make it influential in elevating the people and bring cities and states and nations around to the right way. But that is putting themselves in the place of Jesus Christ. That is putting themselves in the place of God. And that is the papacy over again. That is the beast or his image, one or the other, as the case may be, wherever you find it. So hopefully we can see quite clearly what Jones is saying. That the gospel is spread, not by force, because that's what the state is going to provide, by legislation, rules. But it's, it's revealed, the gospel is revealed in his people, in the character of his people, who operate on the principles of the gospel, the principles of the law of God that are honest, that are true, that are faithful, that are um, selfless, who serve others, who see uh, the good in others and don't see uh, the good in themselves. That trust that God is working and that he can work instead of trying to do God's work for him. And often when we try to do God's work for him, we're really just doing Satan's work. So, so this is a, a really important principle that needs to be understood because my 
my opinion or my view or my observation is that many people who profess to be Adventists are doing the work of Satan on a daily basis and how they judge and criticize others and how they show no Christ-like character in their dealings with others, that they're selfish, self-seeking. And, and, it's, and it's because we don't even understand the gospel. We don't even understand the purpose of why we are Seventh-day Adventists. And we make a pre pretense, which, which I would call sort of sentimentalism, of, of being good, of sharing the gospel. We're critical of those who are truly following God, who are seeking to study God's word. But we've seen this in the church. There's lots of show. And Ellen White, in reading five testimonies, she's describing of the church and this movement in great detail at the present time. Let those who name the name of Christ do it within such integrity and in such absolute surrender to God as will give to God all the place and him alone, all the place that belongs to him. Let the influence all be his. Let the power all be his. Let him alone be looked to and depended upon to do all in all. Then Christians will see the power of God so manifest that they would be ashamed to put themselves forward, to give mold or shape to the influence of Christianity. When people do not give the Lord the place which belongs to him, and therefore do not see what they expect to see, it is very natural that they should begin to think that they are better than the Lord and could do better than he does, and so they must take hold and do the thing their Christianity fails to do. But that, I say again, and you see it plain enough, is only to leave God out and put themselves in his place. And by leaving God out, they leave out his power. And by putting themselves in his place, they put into exercise their own power. And that is worldly, earthly, sensual, and the last, devilish. Now, we take another step in this study in our proclamation of the message against the beast and his image. We will take this step, starting again with the principle of ambassadorship. We are ambassadors for Christ. And as we found in the other lesson, an ambassador is not sent to another country to pry into the affairs or attend to the political concerns of that country, but to attend to the affairs of his own country as they arise in that country. We are ambassadors for Christ. The whole attention of Christians is to be on the things of their own country, the affairs of their own kingdom, and to attend to these as they may arise in the country, on the earth, where they may be sojourning. But as certain as we are Christians, we are strangers and sojourners. Our country is yonder, where we belong. Uh, the particular study that we are taking up tonight is the study of the rights which we have as Seventh-day Adventists, as ambassadors of Christ, as citizens of the heavenly kingdom in the nations and countries upon the earth where we may be sojourning. The rights that we have in opposing the things which we shall have to oppose and which soon we are to meet. The experiences which we have heard Brother Hostler relate tonight cannot be studied any too carefully by Seventh-day Adventists in the United States. God is giving to us the principles and preparing us beforehand for what is, to, what is as certain to come as that the sun shall rise. Now, we can say this about this movement right now. Is God not giving to us principles and preparing us beforehand for what is certain to come? That all of our experience, that's what it is? All that this movement has experienced, the disappointments, the conflicts, the light that he's given us, all of these things are to prepare us because something is coming for which we are not yet prepared. 
Um, in his providence, the Lord prepared the brethren and sisters in Switzerland for crises that have come since they were waked up on that thing, as Brother Hostler has told us. And if we in this country do not accept the principles and put our thoughts and our endeavors upon these principles to understand what God is teaching us in these times and by these things, the crisis will come upon us and find us unprepared. And the danger is that we will miss the point altogether and fail right in the place where God wants us to make a success. We cannot afford to do that. An ambassador then in the country where he may be sojourning is to attend to the affairs of his own kingdom as they may arise there and as they may affect the subjects of his own kingdom. Therefore, if that kingdom or that government in which he may so be sojourning undertakes to enact any laws or take a political course that will infringe the rights of the people of his own country, he has the right, and it is his duty to protest. He has the right to call attention to the principles that will be violated by the government in passing such a law and taking such a course. If that government is independent and sovereign in its own realm and may enact such laws as to it, as to it seem expedient, and these laws may affect the citizens of his own country and may bring hardships upon them. But in the enforcement of these laws, it is the place and the rights of the citizen or ambassador to see to it and insist that the procedure at every step and in every case shall be strictly in accordance with its own jurisprudence and with all the principles of on which the laws are based. Every Christian has the right to protest against any earthly government making any laws on the subject of religion. That is out of their jurisdiction. That invades the realm of the kingdom of God and infringes the rights of the people of the kingdom of God. Therefore, every ambassador of Jesus Christ, <coughs> excuse me, has the inalienable, inalienable right to protest against any such thing by any, any government on the earth. But upon their power and their asserted right to make laws, these governments do go ahead and make laws respecting religion. And then they arrest us and bring us before their tribunals for violating these laws. And when they do that, we have the right to insist that they shall strictly conform to their own laws and the constitutional principles upon which the government governments rest. This is the Christian, the heavenly citizen, has the right to do in addition to the right to protest against their right to make any such laws at all. There is another thought we may look at before turning to the scriptural illustration of this principle. As for the governments of earth, on their own part, they count us their citizens or subjects, even after we have become citizens of the heavenly country. That is, earthly governments do not recognize the tra transference of our citizenship from that government into the heavenly one. And this brings a conflict many times. If every government would recognize this transference of citizenship, and every man that professes to be a Christian from its role of citizens and, or subjects, there would not be so much difficulty on this point, nor so many controversies arising. But these governments do not do that. They propose to hold on to the man even after he has transferred his citizenship, and sometimes they will assert their right to hold him, just as we have learned in the lesson this evening already. They assert their right to control citizens of the heavenly kingdom as though they were still citizens of their former kingdom. We have transferred our citizenship to another country. I'm talking now of Seventh-day Adventists and our citizens of the heavenly country. But on the part of the United States, we are still counted as citizens of the United States because the Constitution says that all persons are born here, are naturalized, are citizens of the United States and the states in which they may reside. Though by our own choice, we are citizens of heaven, and not citizens of the United States anymore. The United States still holds us as citizens. Some of these days, we are going to come in conflict with the United States law as well as state law, not because we are doing wrong, but because they are doing wrong. We shall be arrested, prosecuted, 
and required to respect the law and obey the law. And when they, they do that, as ambassadors for Christ and citizens of the kingdom of God, we have this double right to protest against their right to make the law because it infringes on the rights of the people of the kingdom of God to which we belong. And we have the right also to insist that every step they take shall be strictly according to the fundamental constitutional principles upon which the law is professedly based. Now, I ask you to think of this when you get in, get it in the bulletin. Please read it over because there's a great deal that concerns us in these principles. For there we have an account that goes over this very ground and illustrates to us this principle of holding the government to its own principles. When once without our choice, it has taken us under its juris jurisdiction and proposes to deal with us. Now I will turn to the scripture illustration. Saul of Tars Tarsus was born a citizen of the Roman Empire, as we are of the United States. When he met Christ, he was born again and thus became a citizen of the kingdom of God. And then, then he was the Apostle Paul. His dependence was upon the king of his own country from that time on. His allegiance was to him. His trust was in him, and he left everything to him to be managed. But there came a time when the Roman government took him under their jurisdiction, and when she did, he required her to take every step according to the principles of Roman citizenship and Roman law. In Acts 21, 20, 17, and on to 25, 11, there's an interesting story which let us now take, take up and study. Out of deference to James, the brother of the Lord, and others in Jerusalem who had been in the gospel before him, Paul allowed himself to be persuaded to take a course that was wrong. And he says to see sketches from the life of Paul and which brought him into the place and position where the mob broke loose upon him as related in chapter 21, 27. Read it. Now, who let loose that mob? So we're going to read it. Um, so people know. Um, so it says, and when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews, which were of Asia, and they saw him in the temple, that is Paul, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law, this place, and further brought the Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. For they had seen before with him in the city uh, Trophimus and an Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of this temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band that were that all Jerusalem was in an uproar, who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left a beating of Paul. And some cried one thing and some another. And among the multitude, and when he could not know um, the certainty of the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. And when he came upon the stairs, so it was that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying away with him. And Paul was to be led into the castle. And he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Art thou not thou that Egyptian which before these days made us an uproar, and led us out into the wilderness, 4,000 men that, would, that were murderers? But Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, Tarsus a city of Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. And I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with his hand unto the people. And when the, there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, and then that's going to be chapter 22. Um, and we should be familiar with this story. So we read part of it. Uh, let's go on and see what Jones says here. Now, who let loose the mob? Upon Paul, God did it. 
God did it. For the spirit of prophecy tells us that at the moment when he was talking with the high priest as to the offering that should be made, which was a blood offering, a sin offering would be uh, practically a denial of Jesus Christ if it had not been done or if it had been done. Um, uh, the mob broke loose and saved him from doing it. So this is Jones' opinion about it. I'm not sure if Jones is right here. Um, the Lord saved him from the consequences of the effort of the brethren to get him to compromise in principle out of deference to whom he yielded that far. But how did he get into the hands of the Roman authorities? When he saw that the mob desired to kill him, he thinks I hear him calling loudly for the Roman governor to save him from the mob. Call the Roman governor, hurry up and bring in the troops. They're going to kill me. I'm a Roman citizen. I appeal unto Caesar. Hurry up, hurry up. Call down the captain of the temple, the Roman officer. Don't, don't, please don't let them murder me. Did I hear right? Did he do that? No, no, no. And why not? The captain of the temple was right there and near enough to hear him call if he had done it. According to Roman law, wasn't he a citizen? And therefore, was it not his place to call on the Roman power to protect him? He didn't do it anyway. No, he was the Lord's. He was in the hands of God, and he would let the Lord take care of him. So the spirit of prophecy tells us that God took him here and kept him from that day until the day of his death, nearly all the time in prison, so that the church lost his loving personal ministry because of that compromising attitude into which the brethren had asked him to go. So, so they wanted him to go to the temple. Uh, should Paul have gone? We know that he shouldn't have. And, and so Jones is saying that God is the one that steps in, and, and maybe he's correct um, by having this uproar. But Paul puts himself in the hands of God, not in the hands of the state for protection. So he says, he goes on, well, now he is in the hands of the Roman authorities. Did he ask for it? No. Did he start it? No. Did he assert his Roman citizenship as a claim on which he should be taken and protected by the Roman authorities? No. He asked of the officer permission to speak to the multitude. He was granted. And taking his place on the stairs, he made a speech in chapter 22, verse 1 to 21, where he said that the Lord had said to him, depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. At the word Gentiles, their fury broke out again, and they yelled, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. And as they cast off their clothes and drew through dust in the air, the captain took him away. And thinking from the turmoil about him that he must be some desperate character, ordered him to be scourged. But this was forbidden by Roman law to be inflicted on Roman citizens. And now, as he is in the hands of the Roman authorities, he has the right to insist that they shall proceed according to their own law. And therefore he said, it is not lawful for you to scourge, or is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? This word stopped the proceeding. So you can see how Paul doesn't appeal to Rome to protect him, but he does appeal to Rome to obey their own laws. The next day, the captain, desiring to know what all the the row was really about had the Sanhedrin assemble and sent Paul before them. He had barely began to speak when the high priest commanded some to smite him on the mouth. And Paul said unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? Thus he holds these to the law which governed them in their procedure against him. He was not there from his own choice. They had brought him there without any of his effort. And he had the right to insist that they should conform to their own law and proceed according thereto, and this he did. While he had said, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope of the resurrection of the dead, I am called into question. This set the Pharisees and Sadducees against each other. And as with the Sadducees trying to kill him, and the Pharisees trying to rescue him, he was about to be pulled to pieces. 
the captain sent down the soldiers to take him by force from them. Next, certain ones entered into that curse upon themselves, neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. But by Paul's nephew, this was made known to him and to the captain. In consequence, the captain ordered out 470 soldiers and by them sent Paul away by night and had him brought to Caesarea and delivered to Felix, the governor. A few days afterward, the high priest and the Sanhedrin went down to Caesarea to prosecute Paul and did so, did do so, hiring Tertullus, an orator for their spokesman. After hearing, after the hearing, Felix deferred the case to Lysias might come down. With numerous hearings and delays, two years passed, and Festus succeeded Felix as governor, with Paul still in bonds to please the Jews. Festus passing through Jerusalem, uh, the Jews brought Paul's case up and asked to have him brought up to Jerusalem, intending to kill him as he came. And Festus, however, refused and told them to send down their prosecutions and accuse him at Caesarea. They sent their prosecutors down with Festus, and the next day after his arrival, sitting in the judgment seat, commanded Paul to be brought. The Jews laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. That's chapter 25, 1 to 7. While he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, nor yet against Caesar, have I offended anything at all? But Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, answered Paul and said, Wilt thou go up to Jerusalem and there be judged of these things before me? Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. He was not at Caesar's judgment seat by any choice or effort or desire of his own. Caesar had taken him and had kept him all this time without finding any fault in him. Against no one had he done any wrong, and this governor very well knew. The Roman governor therefore had no right to deliver him to the Jews, merely to please them. Therefore, Paul continued and put a climax to the whole case in these words, for I will be an offender or have, for if I be a, an offender, or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things whereof these accuse me, no man may deliver me in, unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. The Roman governor, as a Roman, had no right to deliver a Roman to the judgment of the Jews. That Roman citizen, being in the hands of the Roman governor, under Roman jurisdiction, by their own choice, had the right to insist that the Roman authorities should obey their own law and confirm their own principles. And instead of delivering him to the Jews, they should keep him and try him and conduct the whole case according to the Roman law. Now you can see here, Jones has thought, thought these things out. He has a reason why he is telling this story. And, but that reason comes from the story itself. I believe that Jones... Uh, has studied this passage to understand it, these uh, chapters and acts. It often caused confusion among Seventh-day Adventists. What is our responsibility to, uh, to the law of the land? And what is our responsibility to God? And so I think Jones is doing a good job here of framing this story. There is the secret of Paul's appeal to Caesar. In its divine example, worked out on the principle of giving to the Christian a double right as ambassadors of God and as cities of the heavenly kingdom. First, to protest against any interference on the part of any earthly government with the laws of the people of the kingdom of God or of the kingdom of God itself. And secondly, when they do interfere and without our choice or desire, take us under their jurisdiction, then we have the divine right as ambassadors and as citizens of another country to demand that they shall follow in strictness the law which governs them in their own realm. God will take care of us under the law and in the realm of which we are citizens. 
and in the kingdom to which we belong. He will attend to that, and he will conduct all these affairs according to his own righteous ways. And in the country where we may be sojourning, when we, they do take us under their jurisdiction, we have the right to demand that they shall deal with us according to the principles of their law. Now, that's the end of that um, message, but let's, let's discuss this a little bit. So, first, we talk about these principles. So, what are the principles that govern us? As Christians, what are the principles that govern us? Anybody? Are you there? It's, it should be a simple question to answer. Okay, love God and neighbor. So love is the actuating principle. From that come all of these other attributes. Honesty is an attribute that comes from the principle of love. It's a principle itself. But love is the foundation of all things. And we need to be honest in dealing with one another. That is, we don't have hidden agendas or political uh, maneuverings to get what we think we want or what we think God wants. Right? We need to be open and honest and straightforward. So we have these principles, and these principles can affect the world if we follow them. But we need to know what that we're separate from the world. So we are ambassadors. This is his main point in this. We are ambassador, ambassadors. We're members of the kingdom of God. And uh, we're ambassadors sent to this country. And so... We, we obey the laws of the country that we're in, but we, and, and if we are obeying the laws of the kingdom that we come from, Christ's kingdom, if there is a conflict between God's laws and man's law, we ought to obey God rather than men. But we need to be good citizens. We need to obey the laws of the land unless they conflict with God's law, unless they conflict with the principle of love. Now, Christians who are of the world seek to accomplish this work of ambassador by appealing to the governments of this world to do their work for them is that a fair statement so christians who are appealing to the state to enforce the laws as they see them of god's kingdom something like the Sabbath or Sunday or anything like that. They are interfering in the laws of that country that they're in, asking that state to bring um, people into conformity using the power of the state rather than the power of the gospel. This, this is the problem. Now, the thing is, we may not be always appealing to the state in every instance because we can do that in other ways. That is, who's, who's the, um, the prince of this world or the god of this world? 
this world, whose kingdom is it? So we're, we're from heaven. Christ is our king. Who's the king of this world? Okay, Heidi says Satan. Yeah, yeah. Satan is the king of this world. This is his kingdom. And if we ask Satan to do God's work, uh, what work will he really do? He can only do his work. He has no interest in God's kingdom. And so when we seek the power of the state to make things better, to make this world a better place in our minds, to make it more moral or more right, we're interfering in Satan's kingdom, the kingdom of this world. We need to use the gospel to do this work. Only the gospel can change people's hearts. And I know there is a place for protest against any interference on the part of any earthly government with the laws of the people of the kingdom of God or of the kingdom of God itself, right? So that's what Jones says. Right? They can't go against our conscience. And so we can protest in that sense. But we can't make the world a better place by becoming political. So, so this principle that, that Jones has illustrated so well, um, we can see how it applies at the present time in the situations that we have been in. So, so hopefully this this has been helpful. This 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 study. And any thoughts on it? I know I haven't had much people talking. Just uh, the odd note in the chat. Can we see the importance of it? What Jones is doing, where he is going. So he's he's going to go on in in um, next Friday when we read this. He's going to go on and and finish this part off. Um, though he's going to expand upon it um, in other places. But uh, we need to understand these principles of how we are to act, how we, do, we are to treat one another, how we are to trust that God is in control, and how this relates to the third angel's message. Okay, so... We're going to close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we've had here this evening. We ask for your continued presence in our lives. We pray for the Sabbath, that this Sabbath can be a blessing. And um, we pray for each person. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.